Well, good morning. Welcome to Trader's Point. We're so glad you guys are here with us this weekend. Come on, join us as we sing. Here we go. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at his feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame now robed in majesty. The radiance of perfect love now shines for all to see. Come on, let's lift it up. Your name. Your name, your name is victory. And our praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. And our praise will rise to Christ our King. Oh, the fear that held us now gives way to Him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross. Now alive in me. Oh, your name, your name, your name is victory, and our praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. your spirit by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name I come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit I Your name is victory 
Show us your glory. 
Savior say Thy strength indeed is small Child of weakness, watch and pray Find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all All to him I Did white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper's spot. Jesus paid it all, all to him I am. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. died my soul to say my lips shall still be Jesus paid it all all to him my sin had left a crimson stain he washed it right Everything you've done for us, you 
give the glory, you give the honor, cause you're worthy, Lord. Jesus, we thank you for paying the ultimate sacrifice. We thank you for paying the ultimate price for us. You lived the perfect life that we could never live. You died the death that we deserved. Because of your death and your resurrection, we now have hope of eternal life with you. So we thank you for that gift. Jesus, I pray right now that you would have your way in this service. That you would open our hearts, open our minds to what you would have to say. Speak to us. Move however you want to move. We give you all the glory, all the honor. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Well, welcome to Trader's Point. We are so glad that you're here with us this weekend. And if this is your first time, please know that you are always welcome. And we'd love to see you back here next weekend. Well, right now we're getting ready to hear from our downtown campus pastor, Ryan Bramlett. But before we do that, why don't we turn around and greet some of the folks around us? What's your next step? Growth Track is made up of four weekly experiences designed to help you grow in your relationship with God, connect to the church, and discover your purpose. You can jump in at any time, and next week is a great place to start with week one immediately following every service. It lasts about 40 minutes, and if you're a parent and plan to attend, you can pick up your kids after the session. Visit our website for more information. We can't wait to meet you. Here at Traders Point, we have an incredible opportunity to be joyful in our generosity. Every year we focus our efforts on a few strategic areas. Let's take a look at this year's focus. When you give at Traders Point, a portion of everything you contribute goes to our outreach partners to reach those who need it the most. As the church, we want to be the kind of people who help restore what's been broken in Jesus' name. And we want to share that hope with others in real, tangible ways. This year, through our year in giving, we have the opportunity to partner with Hands of Hope, an organization that's making a real impact in Indy's foster care crisis. I think a lot of people may not be aware of the situation in Indiana with foster care. It, we really do have a crisis in our state. There's over 15,000 kids in foster care in the state of Indiana. It's over twice the rate of the national average. There's the drug epidemic that's going on right now. It's causing more and more children to come into the foster care system. Uh, domestic violence is a huge issue. Abandonment, there's a lot of children coming in the system and we sometimes just don't have enough foster homes. Hands of Hope is involved in providing practical opportunities for people to get engaged in foster care to make a difference in these kids' lives. We do that by coming along Department of Child Services. We also support the foster families through things such as the care communities, putting a team around one foster family. So they provide meals, they provide watching the children, and they also provide prayer support. Some of the kids who go into foster care, they're going there purely just out of neglect or things that could be helped. 
Care Portal is an online tool that connects families in need with churches who can help. The primary thing this is doing is it's allowing the kids who can stay in a home stay in a home by helping the church come alongside and meet the immediate needs of these families. The way to make a difference is to get engaged in the life of a child in foster care. Make a difference in that child's life and you'll break that cycle for their generation. Here at Traders Point, our mission is the same. We want to continue to reach and serve as many people as we can throughout our city so that everyone can have access and hear the message of the gospel. You know, we've seen God do incredible things over these past few years here at Traders Point, uh, specifically with the launch of our campuses. You know, we've had over 1,800 people in the past two years who have made the decision to give their lives to Jesus and get baptized. I mean, that number alone should inspire us and compel us to keep going. We've got over 5,000 people right now throughout all of our campuses that are meeting weekly in groups and being discipled and they're growing with other believers. It's incredible. And so because of that, we gotta keep going because there's still 1.7 million people in our city that need to have barriers removed for them so that they can come to know who Jesus is. And so we gotta keep going. We gotta keep launching more campuses in our city. God says to his church, to you and to me, just regular people, he says, I want you to go. I want you to represent me to, to hurting and broken people. And so our desire to reach people really is found in that promise that God's close to the brokenhearted. And so every person that we serve, every person that we love, every person that we encourage, uh, we want to give them that hope that God has given to us through Jesus. Everything you give throughout December will go directly to that mission. Thanks to your generous year-end contributions, we're able to help vulnerable children in our city and remove unnecessary barriers that keep people from Jesus. Traders Point, welcome. How are we doing? Good. Hey guys, my name is Ryan and actually the campus pastor at our downtown campus. But today, today I have the honor of being here with you and I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, it is wild. Wild that I'm here on this stage and by the end of this thing you will see why that is so crazy. Um, but before we get rolling with what we're going to look at today, we have to stop and look back and celebrate what just happened. A lot of you know, last week we had our Christmas services. We had 25 services over four campuses over five days. And guys, we had 18,700 people show up to hear about Jesus. Un unreal. And I want everyone to hear this. Like, 18,000 people, 25 services, that does not happen without a small army of volunteers, of men, women, and children sacrificing and serving like crazy to pull that off. So at every campus, can we put our hands together, show some love for all of our volunteers that made that happen. And we're going to keep on celebrating our guy, Aaron Brockett, preaching seven sermons that week, getting better and better, MJ in the finals. Anybody want to give it up for him? Unreal. And I'm telling you, he's going to be back uh, next Sunday kicking off a brand new series titled Killing What's Killing You, so make sure that you get back for that. But what a week and what a year, really, because, I mean, here we are. It's New Year's Eve, Eve, and we're about to turn the page on this thing. We're about to go into 2019, and we are going to celebrate, right? Like, that's what New Year's is all about, us getting together and celebrating making it. Whether you're going to be a room with a, in a room with people you love, with people you don't really like, on the couch with just your dog watching the ball drop, we're all going to get together and shout down, three, two, one, happy new year, because we love celebrating, right? We will take any chance we get to celebrate, we'll celebrate, calendars changing, and I will tell you, the stretch of the century, half birthdays. I, I'm, I'm cool with birthdays, but I will throw a cat a pajama party before I celebrate and recognize your half birthday. But we love parties. Sometimes we throw a celebration for a big event like a wedding or a graduation, or maybe some of us celebrated when our parents left for a weekend by throwing a party in their house. Anybody do that? You can't lie in church, get those hands up. I didn't, I didn't, not because I didn't want to, but whenever my parents left, I left as well. They were not leaving me there to figure things out. But what I wanna look at today is what does God celebrate, right? You ever thought about that? Like, what brings God to the point of wanting to throw a party in the first place? What gets his heart beating? 
That's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to be jumping into a story that Jesus told about the heart of God. And I'm telling you, it is, it's big enough to change everything. If you're here and you don't know the heart of God, maybe you're thinking, I don't even think God celebrates anything from the God I know. I'm so thankful that you're here. And over our time together, that's what we're going to do. Like my hope is that we could just take a stethoscope and attach it to God. We could just hear his heart beat to see what he celebrates, to see what parties he's throwing and who's on the guest list. Because I'm telling you, it could change everything. And to look at this, to see the kind of party God wants to throw, we are going to be in Luke chapter 15. And we're going to kick things off in verse 1. But before we get there, I just want to set the scene for us for what we are going to be walking into you see, in Luke 15, Jesus has already begun his ministry. He's going from town to town, telling everyone what God is like. He's healing people. He's doing miracles, all of this. And because of the way he's operating, a lot of friction is starting. It's starting because of his teachings and things that he's doing. But the big one that we're going to see, he has a lot of problems with who he is associating with, all right? Who he's associating with, because there's some people there that think Jesus is attending the wrong parties, right? They're trying to shut fun down before it ever gets started, and Jesus is going to step on the scene and everything changes. But take a look at this. Luke 15, starting in verse 1. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach, and this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even, doesn't stop there, even eating with them. I laugh every time I read that. It's like you just see these guys getting so worked up. They are so angry, and they're sitting in the back of the room. They're like, man, do you believe this? Did you see Jesus last week? No, what was he doing? He was associating. He was associating with sinful people, and that's not it. The next week, he was eating with them, even eating with them. It's like when my kids get all worked up, and they're fighting. I'm like, why are you so upset? I'm like, he's bothering me. I'm like, what is he doing? He's looking at me. <laughs> you know, I downplay what we just read about them getting up in arms about eating with these notorious sinners and tax collectors. But the truth of it is this is a really big deal. You see, in ancient Near East, to sit down and to share a meal with someone, that was a token of acceptance. So what Jesus is doing here, in the name of God, he's sitting down with these notorious sinners and tax collectors, and he's saying, I am accept you. I accept you. Notorious sinners, tax collectors, everyone in between. In the name of God, I accept you. And this is not going over very well. Because you, to understand who he's extending this acceptance to, you got to understand who these tax collectors and notorious sinners are. You see, the tax collectors here, these aren't your regular run-of-the-mill H&R Block associates, okay? These aren't the guys that are helping you get your taxes done at the end of the year. They were the most hated and despised people of their time. They worked for the Roman government, a regime that was just brutally killing everyone that got in their way. And they would send these tax collectors to get money to go to the empire to make it even bigger. And a lot of times these guys, they, they were crooked. So they would inflate the taxes, take an extra cut off top before they returned it to the government. They were hated and they were the lowest of the low. And notorious sinners, this is not just for people that didn't go to church, that weren't that religious. Notorious sinners, this would have been the people with almost physical markers. Like these are the people with disabilities that can't work. These are, these are the people with diseases. These are the prostitutes at, at the bottom. These are the marginalized people of society. And Jesus is associating with them. More than that, he's saying, I accept you. And in the background, the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees, they're hurt. And they can't process it in their mind because they think because of what they've done, the titles that they hold, who they are, they should be more valuable. They should be treated better. They are worth more than these notorious sinners and tax collectors. And Jesus hears all of this, and that prompts him to tell the story that we're going to read. And I'm telling you, it's crazy. Like the story we are going to read, he shows us that acceptance, that's just, that's just the beginning, that there is so much more for all of us in the room today. Take a look at this. Starting in verse 8, this is Jesus talking now. He says, suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Now won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice. Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. 
And some of you are like, what? Like, we want to talk about what does God celebrate? What kind of party does God throw? Let's talk about some coins. Some of you are like, this is why we don't let Christians throw the parties. You guys are doing it. You're doing it all wrong. You shouldn't have coins there. You probably want to show me some stamps later. But the important thing to see here, the big thing we have to note is this is God sharing the heart of God, all right, in front of us. And what he's saying is that the lost coins here, the representative of lost people, all right? So that's the, 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 the translation. These are the lost people, the ones that the religious leaders and the Pharisees are upset that Jesus is talking to and talking about. And he says that if a woman has 10 coins and she loses one of these coins, so if one person is lost, won't she drop everything and start searching after them. And that, that gives us the first thing that we need to see from this story, that we noticed that the coin was lost, but it wasn't forgotten. And we really got to pay really close attention to that because we all have things in our lives that we've lost, but it's because we forgot about them. We don't think about them and then they become lost. Like for example, if you came up to me after service today and you said, hey, Ryan, can I, can I borrow some of your workout equipment? Like, can I get your chin up bar? Can I get your dumbbells and borrow them? I couldn't let you do that because I have no idea where they are, all right? They have been lost. They are forgotten about. I haven't used them. Do you know how far I've fallen off of the workout train? When I was writing this sermon, it really hit me. I yelled down to my wife. I said, hey, babe, have you seen my comfy pants? And by comfy pants, I meant my workout pants. I meant the pants that Nike spent months in a lab engineering for working out, and I had reduced them to my comfy pants that I was gonna ride in. <laughs> but we all have things like that, right? Things that we forgot about. They're lost, but we're not thinking about them. The important thing that we see here is that that is not the way God views you. Whether you're here, you believe, you don't believe, you're unsure, I want you to see that, that God says that you are worth it. That to God, you are worth dropping everything for and searching after right there in the moment. Because it says she had 10. The moment she realized one was gone, that coin was worth so much that she dropped everything. Because to God, you are worth it. So turn to the person next to you and just say, hey, you are worth it. All right. Now turn to the other person. The one that for whatever reason you decided wasn't worth it in the moment. And you let them know, hey, you're worth it too. <laughs> no, you are worth it. Like that's what this, this, what this story that Jesus tells shows us, that you haven't been forgotten. You're being searched after. You aren't forgotten. You are searched after. Because you know the word that's used here um, when it's talking about why everyone's up in arms, that Jesus is associating with these people? The word associating, it's not a strong enough translation. The picture that we really get of the word that's used for associating is, is you get this picture of Jesus anxiously and like eagerly awaiting, like on the balls of his feet, looking for people that are lost. Like he is scouting them out. He is searching them out. He is looking left and right, trying to find them simply because he has decided that they are worth that much to God. That we aren't forgotten, that we are searched after. Because God believes that we are worth so much. He has placed that value on each and every one of us. And I know as we go through life, a lot of times that truth is hard to hold on to. And it feels like our value is just kind of like the stock market. It goes up some days, it goes down. When we have good days, we feel great. and bad days, we don't. And we can have a stretch there. Or maybe you have a, a string of bad days. You, you fall back into that addiction your anxiety ramps up and you begin to think, man, I am messed up, I am broken. And the thought that a lot of times follows is, man, if there is a God, if he's still there, there's no way he hasn't walked away from me yet. For sure, he has walked away. But guys, the beauty in this story is that God is not walking away from you. He is walking towards you. That God doesn't see the same way that, that we do. That God has already said that your value, it's set. Get this, Jesus determined our value when he went to the cross. When God decided that we were worth dying for, that he would send his own son to die for me and you, our worth is done, it is set. And nothing in this world can steal that. No amount of bad days, 
No amount of darkness, no matter how lost you feel, God is with you. You have not been forgotten. You are being searched after. And I, I just want us to, to, to just, just live in that for a little bit because this is what it says about God when it comes to me and you, that he was willing to search for us, that we hadn't been forgotten because that's what, exactly what we see in the story, that the moment that the coin was recognized as being lost, a search starts. And it is a all out effort to find this thing because if the coin would have fallen, it wouldn't have fallen onto your engineered hardwood floors. It wouldn't have fallen on a memory foam carpet. It would have fallen on dirt. It would have fallen in dust. It would have been hard work to find it. It says she would have had to sweep the floors and light a lamp, search every nook and cranny to find this thing because it was worth so much to her. If the coin hadn't been forgotten, it was worth the search and she was gonna do everything she could to find it. Guys, the parallel in this story, the parallel of this woman searching after the coin in the darkness, in the dirt, the same thing is true for God when it comes to me and you. Like that's what Jesus did when he came. If you're unsure about what Jesus' ministry looked like when he came to earth, that's exactly what he did. Just like this woman swept the floors and lit a lamp looking for this lost coin, Jesus did the same thing. He went from town to town, sweeping the streets, going from house to house, from city to city, letting everyone know that there was a truth, that they hadn't been forgotten, that they were actually being searched after, that they were accepted. And that was just the beginning that God was going into the darkness. God was looking for the people that said that they had no value, that felt like they were at the bottom of society, the marginalized people. God said, I'm gonna come to live in the margins. But yeah, he said, I'm gonna come to erase the margins all together, that I'm gonna erase them. Because with Jesus, there's no longer these titles, there's no longer good and bad, they're simply lost and found. There's dead and there's alive. And thank Jesus that a search party was sent for me and you to find us, that God was willing to go into all of that for me and you. We haven't been forgotten. Hear that, church. We have not been forgotten. And, and I want to go there for a second. This picture of a search party. That's what this, this, this shows us, this image of God searching, of God going from house to house and city to city, looking for those who were lost. It's a search party. And a lot of you, you, you know what that picture represents. Maybe you've been a part of one. Maybe you saw one on the news or in a movie. What you see in a search party is something has gone horribly wrong. Someone is lost, and we send a search party. And you see people going from the city streets, sweeping every piece of ground, lighting lamps, holding lights in their hands so they don't even have to stop when the sun drops because what is missing is far too valuable to be forgotten. And they sweep the streets, and they go, and they look over and over again. There's a search party. It's like everyone's holding their breath until they can find that person that is missing. Guys, when we get to what this story represents, when it's not just a woman looking for a lost coin, but it's people, and it's not those people, but it's us, when it's God, when we see God as the one leading the search party, that he would be the light, that he would go into the darkness, that he would go into the brokenness, that God would wrap himself in the flesh and bones, that he spoke into existence in the first place and he would go and he would sweep the streets from town to town, letting everyone know who they were and how valued they, they were. And he wouldn't stop there. Jesus would go into the darkest place we had ever created for ourselves, death. Jesus would take on death and he would defeat death. Light would shine even in darkness and he would bring us hope. And because of Jesus, the lost would be found. And because of Jesus, the dead would come alive. Thank Jesus, a search party was sent for me and you. And now that we're there, if you can picture that search party, you can picture the urgency, you can picture how crazy it was, people just scouring the lands, going trying to find this person that was lost. Imagine the party that would ensue when that search party returned. Imagine. 
Just that search party coming back, lights in one hand, holding him or her on their shoulders, walking them back to their home. Think of how everyone would go crazy. The, the scripture here, it tells us exactly what the response is of, of God. It says, and when she finds it, when that lost coin is found, when that person is found, it says she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice. Rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. Hear this, in the same way. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. And we see this story change really quick. From this image of a search party, everyone doing everything they can to find this person that is lost, to as they're returning, it immediately turns to a block party. And this lady calls out to all of her friends and family and everyone comes out and they celebrate like crazy. And what's even wilder is that this tells us that in the same way, in the same way, that is what happens in heaven when one person is found. That when you are found, when you come to know Jesus, when you start following him, it says that that is such a big deal because you are worth that much that all of heaven throws a party. Because what does God celebrate? What brings God to the point of throwing a party? It's you. God celebrates you. God celebrates you. Come on. This is what he left heaven for. This was what his work came to do because he celebrates you when we become found. And guys, the parties aren't done. The block parties, the search parties, we are still going. You see, because when Jesus, when he defeated death, when he gave us hope, as he left, he looked to his followers, the ones that he had just found, the ones that still had the dirt on them from when he picked them up and he said, now you go. You're gonna be the search party. And this is how the church started, a search party going from town to town, telling everyone there that no matter what they felt as their value, if they felt overlooked or overshadowed, that there was a God that loved them enough to die for them. And they went from town to town, finding these people. And they went from, from being lost to being found. 2,000 years, search parties have been sent. And the search party is still going. I'm here because I was found. Like, I, I didn't grow up in the church. I was found by a search party this church sent out nine years ago. You want to know why it's so wild that I'm up here preaching today? Because it feels like just yesterday I was sitting on the other side of this. But when I was 20 years old, I got set up on a blind date with a woman. And I really didn't know anything about her. She didn't know anything about me. And we went out for the night. It was a group of us, and it was great. And we're hanging out. But I quickly noticed there was something different about her. I'd never met anyone like this. And it, it was more than this, but it wasn't less. She didn't even cuss. Like we were together the whole night and not one little tiny nothings. Nothing slipped out, but it was, it was more than that. It's like she wasn't moved by what was going on around her. It's like she had been given a different script to live by than I had. I had been, I was curious, but I really didn't know why. You ever been there? And at the end of the night, I said, hey, I would love to go out on a date with you. And she said yes. And we went out that Friday, and it was a great night, I'm telling you. We went to Max and Irma's, one of the fanciest restaurants Indy has to offer. <laughs> and we went to the movies, and we saw the latest and greatest Nicholas Sparks Channing Tatum film, Dear John. It was a great night. And I'm dropping her back off at her house. And I said, hey, great, had a great time. She said, me too. Um, she said, hey, hey, would you want to go to church with me on Sunday? And I said, hey, no. Uh, <laughs> now, now I don't want to go to church with you on Sunday. I said, I'm a good person, but church, it's just, it's just really not my thing. Thanks, but, you know, no thanks. And she was pretty confused. Um, and she just kind of looked at me and she said, I don't go to church because I'm a good person or it's not why we go. we go. I go to church because of Jesus. And then she told me in this moment, she said, Jesus was the son of God. That Jesus was sent here, lived this life for me, died for me. And in that moment, I was trying to picture it. Like I was trying to picture if there could be a God like that. Because I never thought much about God before that night. But if I did, it was a God of morality, like a God of good people. And from my experience, I'm being honest, it was a God of, of arrogant people. It wasn't of a God that would send his only son. 
It wasn't of the God that we've been talking about today, the one that says that we are accepted, the one that says you're not forgotten, that you are searched after. It wasn't that God. But as I was sitting there trying to connect all of the dots, man, is this real? Is, is God really like this? And I couldn't shake it. So by the time she got out of the car, I changed my answer. I said, yeah, I, I do want to go to church with you on Sunday. And when I came to church, I came here. Here. I came to this building, this room right here. I sat right over there. Brockett was standing here. He didn't mess it up too bad. And I got to hear again <laughs> who Jesus is and what he's about. And I'm telling you, my life changed. I, I saw myself as someone that was pretty put together to someone that was lost, that was in need of being found. Like I was more messed up than I ever thought possible. But at the same time, I was more loved than I ever knew. I was worth dying for. And I came back and back again, and I learned more, and I saw more of who Jesus was. And I got to this point, I said, you know what, this is, I believe this. This is real. I'm giving my life to it. I want to be baptized. And I was baptized right over there in that baptistry. <laughs> Wild. And I came out and I said, all right, this is it. I'm telling everyone everywhere who Jesus is and all that he's done. And I messed it up horribly <laughs> along the way. But God still used me. Two years after I got baptized, I got to baptize my own mother. Once again, in that baptistry right over here. Guys, we're talking about generations changing. We're talking about eternity changing. Because God sent a search party for me. And it was led by a woman named Stephanie. And today, Stephanie is my wife. She is the mother of my three children. Look at that. And with a conversation on a Friday night about who Jesus is, everything changed. And now heaven's going to be a little bit more crowded and hell a little bit more empty because of her faith, because of that search party. And guys, God's not done. God's not done sending search parties. He is still going. And we just had this, this beautiful picture of what it looks like. Because that's really when this begins to crystallize, when you see the church picking up the role of Jesus. That as Jesus went from town to town, sweeping the streets, looking for those that were lost, now the church is the woman in that story. The church is the one being sent out, and that's when you see the, church part, uh, the search party. But look at this picture. This was at our Christmas services last week. And we do this every year, and it's a beautiful picture. And what it's representative of is, is the light of the world coming here, Jesus coming here. But what you see, thousands of people standing there holding a light. Now, as you see that picture inside this building, it's beautiful. But imagine if you saw this in our city. Like, imagine if you saw that coming down the road. Imagine if you saw that in Carmel, in Avon, downtown, here on the northwest side. Imagine if you saw that. That would be serious. That would be a search party. And guys, that is what Jesus has called us to do. That every single week we would leave here and we would be the search party that God is sending. Because there are 1.7 million people here that are lost 1.7 people, million people here that need to know of the love of God, that they haven't been forgotten, that they are being searched after till this very day, and we would be the ones that go to them. We would be the ones that get to help find them, and we would treat them just like God treats them, which means we love them, which means we associate with them, which means we even eat with them, and we love them right where they are, not faking anything, but we love them, and they come to know Jesus like this love that God has given us, this search party he sent us for, it's for the 15,000 kids right now in the foster care system. 15,000 kids that are motherless and fatherless. They need to know more than anything that there is a God that loves them, that there is a God that is searching after them, that they are valued, that they are loved, and nothing is going to stop us from getting to them. Because God's in a search party. And guys, this year, I know I've done it before, but we get into this spot where we begin to just kind of put people in categories, people that we live with, people that we see all the time. We say, you know, they're, they're just too far gone. They wouldn't accept this. They wouldn't be interested in this. They're too crazy. Um, maybe your family is a little crazy. I don't know. Um, not mine. Uh, but whatever it is, I just, I just want to stop right now and say, don't let that lie creep in. 
Don't begin to put anyone into a box. Don't put anyone into a place where they're too far gone because God will go to lengths we can't imagine to reach his lost sons and daughters. And the beautiful thing about this story of Jesus making a switch here and referring to people that don't know him as lost, that completely changes the way you view something that is lost. Like when something is lost, you don't get mad at it for being lost. With the story here, when, when the woman lost the coin, she didn't begin yelling at the coin and getting frustrated at the coin. She just got to work to find it. When Jesus saw us from heaven, that we were broken, messed up, we were his enemy, he didn't yell at us for being lost. He got to work finding us. When me and you get to work finding those that are lost, that's when everything begins to change. Imagine if we would leave here and we'd go through this year seeing people the way God sees them, seeing them as lost seeing them as, as, as in need of a search party and we were the only one that was sent. Think about how gentle we would be. Think about how loving we would be. Think about how caring we would be. And guys, I think if we can do that, everything could change. Guys, let's make 2019 the year we do whatever it takes to get the person on our heart into a relationship with Jesus, that, that, that they would come to know the love of God. Like, that's our prayer as a church, that no one would be safe from the love of God. And guys, we are all a part of the search party. No one's excluded. You believe in Jesus, come on, grab a light, get to work. We are going to go find in some people. This isn't for the perfect Christians. This isn't for the Christians that have been Christians for years. This isn't for you when you graduate. This is us right now. We are the search party. Let's go. Because I'm telling you, God is already 10 steps ahead of us. He's already laid his cards on the table. He's shown us what he's going to do in 2019. We just have to be willing to go with him. Like in the beginning of the story, it tells us, it gives us the definite response of what God is going to do. Because it says, if a woman loses a coin, won't she? Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? This is God's response to lost sons and daughters. His response is, I'm going to do whatever it takes to find them. Are we going to go with him? And I hope wherever you are today, wherever you are in what you believe, you believe in God, you're unsure, you don't know. I just pray that you could hear these words this year, they would echo in your mind. No matter the situation you find yourself in, won't he? Won't he do it? No matter where you are, what situation you find yourself in in 2019, whether you're on the side of, I just don't even think God accepts me, I think he's walked away from me, you could say, won't he? Won't he walk towards me? Won't he search after me? That if you're here and you just feel like everything has been taken from you, you don't feel like you have anyone there, you could say, won't he? Won't he hear my prayers? That if you're having troubles going through any kind of relationship struggles, that you could say, won't he? Won't he restore that relationship with my father? Won't he? There's hope. Won't he send his only son to die for me? Won't he? Like, won't he meet me right here in my mess, even when I messed up again? Won't he? Won't he forgive me? Won't he forgive me again? Won't he be with my kids that have walked away from the faith? Won't he? Isn't he standing right there waiting for them to turn back around? Won't he be there to catch them? Won't he? God's all in. Look at this, Romans 8.32. It says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he? Won't he also give us everything else? Won't he? Won't he leave a heaven to start? Won't he leave heaven to start a search party for you? Won't he search and sweep the streets until he finds you? Won't he show up time in and time out? God moved heaven and earth for this. He's not stopping now. He didn't stop even when it meant sending his only son to die for me and you. And now, church, we are the search party. And if you're here today, If you're here today and maybe you're hiding in plain sight, you're in the shadows wondering, can God be this good? Is God really like this? I just want to say we would be honored to throw a party in your name. We would be honored to celebrate with you. So please come up here and talk with someone before you leave today. And guys, our hope, our hope for this year is that we would leave every single Sunday and a search party would be sent sent from here, north, downtown, west, and we would take more and more ground. And every single week, people would return, going from lost to found. 
and we would celebrate. We would throw the biggest party you've ever seen. We would see life change. We would see baptisms, and we would party our faces off, knowing that the party that's happening here has nothing on the one that is going on in heaven. Come on. Guys, what I want us to do right now is just we're going to go into a moment of reflection, a moment where we can just sit there and just focus on God really being this good, that he's already laid his cards on the table. Now me and you get to respond. We get to join the search party. We get to pick up a light and a broom and start working on that person that God has laid on our heart. So just take the next few minutes. I'm going to pray for us, and then just take the next few minutes and just sit on that and to think about this kind of God. Let's pray. God, we love you. God, you are wild. Wild enough to send a search party because you love us that much. Wild that because of you, we could go from lost to found, we could go from dead to alive. Because of you, we have hope. We have hope that nothing can steal because our value is set in you. And God, thank you for this opportunity to join you in the search party. God, allow us to see this world like you see it. Allow our heart to break for what yours breaks for. God, allow us to join in on the celebration this year. Let us, let us be reminded that what we do here, and as crazy as we go, and as hard as we go, and the parties we have, and the celebrations that happen, it's nothing on what's going on up there. Jesus, we love you. It's in your perfect name we pray, amen. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live for you We could 
could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, oh, we live for you. Sing holy, and holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and to those are holy, holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those are Thank you.